We will, but even I, and I guess you as well, would like to ask some questions and get into some discussions afterwards, don't you? We will get that time. But before that, I promise you, I have a lovely speaker coming on the stage. Uh, her name is Mania Klemensic. She is um, she's a doctor, and she is at Harvard University. A year ago, approximately, I had the honor to come and, and lecture in your course, and now today you're going to lecture for us. So I think it's interesting and fantastic. Um, so let's, let's leave it for you, and uh, enjoy. Hello, good morning, everybody. I should first say that um, this is my second time in Bologna, and my first time in Bologna was actually 20 years ago, on the 17th and 18th of June, 1999, when the Bologna Declaration was signed. And at that time, I was a student representative coming with the ESIP, now ESU delegation. And uh, so now I'm in a bit of a different capacity and still concerned about similar topics, believe it or not, 20 years later. So we have heard from Toyn and the students about the values, the purpose of student-centered learning. What I want to talk about today is really more moving into the high-impact practices in this regard. Um, let me just say that if you were my students and if that was my classroom, you would not have experienced 30 minutes lecture, uh, which I am about to give today. What would most likely happen is that I would start with a prompt and would ask you in a think, pair, share activity to either define what student-centered learning is, or I would ask you to chart the basic elements of the student-centered learning uh, ecosystem, or I would ask you to think about the main misconceptions concerning student-centered learning. And you would be gathered, even in a bolted chairs as we have here, you would be gathered in a groups of three and three and three, and you would be thinking and sharing on that particular prompt. And I would give you probably five minutes, and in five minutes I would take that board at the back and I would start inviting you to bring in the input on one of those prompts that I have given you. And as you would be giving it, I would be complementing it with mini lecture where I would be bringing in the Dewey and the Piaget and Vygotsky and all others, referring back to what you have said and then kind of rounding it up in what I have intended to be the lecture of this class. And we would probably in 30 minutes likely go through two cycles of that kind of prompts, you work, you give your input and I complement it and I draw back and we co-construct the, the knowledge. But you are not my students and this is not my classroom and you are the makers of higher education in your respective departments, your respective institutions, uh, in your respective countries. And I am to set out to give a 30 minutes of an informative, hopefully, uh, lecture. What, uh, I also have to say that where I'm, where I'm drawing on in this lecture is a forthcoming handbook, Routledge Handbook on Student-Centered Learning and Instructions, which uh, an instruction which I co-edit with uh, Sabine Hoyden from, from St. Gallen University. It will be published in the next six months. Um, February 2020 is the prescribed day, and what we aim to do with this is to offer really the most comprehensive, most up-to-date um, overview of the fundamentals of the uh, student-centered learning and instruction and application to practice. So we have uh, 40 contributors from all over the world bringing really case studies of their institutional practices. So this is where I'm bringing in what I'm going to talk about. Um, first, let me start with some good news. The basic EHA, European Higher Education Area Policies, have some have touched on the basic elements of student-centered learning. What we have there is we have a clear linkage to the learning uh, outcomes, very important. We have mention of effect, effective support and guidance. We have mention of professional development of the teachers. Uh, since Paris uh, uh, Communique, we have also student-centered learning linked to flexible pathways and within the EU renewed modernization agenda, we have the mentioning of the importance of technology in particular in enabling the individualized flexible learning and mentioning of the real world 
activities and work-based uh, uh, activities. So we have a very, very good basis for the work and implementation with, within, the, uh, within the Bologna process. What we are really missing, and that has been highlighted by the ESO, by the EUA, is a comprehensive framework for the student-centered learning. And what we are also missing, we are missing of a clear indicators that would enable evaluation to demonstrate that student-centered learning approach is actually happening, that we see it in the institutions. So for this talk, I'm trying to tackle those two weaknesses. I'm trying to speak about what I have labeled as a student-centered learning higher education ecosystems and show the key elements with that ecosystem and then talk about how we can possibly evaluate it and how we can evaluate it both on the system level, on the institutional level and at the departmental level. So that's, that's the basis uh, of my talk. Let me start uh, by discussing what are the key elements of this student-centered uh, higher education ec ecosystem. The basis, of course, will be, and it always starts with the study program and the course design, the, the basic linkage to the learning outcomes. The learning, flexible learning pathways is another element of it. Learner support or student support uh, is another element. Teacher support and the whole package of teaching staff is another one. Technology and spaces, learning technology and the learning spaces, the whole learning infrastructure is another element. And the, and the last one that I would like to highlight is the, what I call community learning connections. And I'll speak more about those. Among those, I will speak mostly about student, student uh, study program and curriculum design, uh, the learner and teacher support, and then the last one, community learning uh, connections. If you will be picking up the Routledge handbook in the end, you will have uh, articles on all of the uh, different elements, but, uh, but in interest of time, these are the ones that I would like to speak about specifically. Let's go to the heart of the student-centered learning, and that is really study program and the course design. Often what we see when we discuss in the scholarship about student-centered learning is that it's somehow removed from the knowledge. That is very much focused on the learning process itself, but not always we see that it's uh, that it's linked to the learning outcomes. It is almost as generic solutions on the learning process are possible. And I would argue they are not, they are not. We always, always have to think about students' certain learning approaches in the context of a specific study program or the discipline. Because what we know is that knowledge, the, there are different methods and different ways of knowing within each individual discipline. And then there are no generic solutions, there are no quick fixes, no techniques that you can be easily applied across the study programs. And that's a kind of a personal, don't waste time on a kind of a generic consultants coming to your institutions trying to implement or help you implement the, uh, the, the student centered approaches. It's a waste of time. Where you can really make a difference is on the departmental level, within the study programs, where you get the people, either you send them out to the academic conferences where they will be speaking about different way of teaching in their particular disciplines, or they will be picking up uh, handbooks where they can learn something like that. But that discussion has to happen in the context of the specific discipline, specific uh, study program, specific courses, not just generically. And that's something, because the nature of the knowledge vary, as I said before. So within that each study program, we still have to think that they are elements. Let's say that when I was a student, I took 47 courses. I think there were 43 required, but I was ambitious. Within these 43 courses, I should have had an opportunity to have some inquiry-based exposure, to have some kind of a research-based activity. I should have had exposure to peer-to-peer -peer learning, another high-impact student-centered practice. I should have had exposure to project-based or real-world type of uh, um, learning. I should have had exposure to collaborative learning, which again teaches us how to work together as a community of practice or, or, or a team. All of those are seen as high impact practices. And within each study program, we have to look through each of the courses and how 
there is a sequences of the learning. When is the fundamental knowledge that is impaired to the students? When the students can move into the application model? And what each course, which elements of the student-centered learning practice each course will be offering to the students? So that's kind of a message. So, so we know, I mean, from the literature, high-impact practices are inquiry-based, collaborative, peer-to-peer. -peer. And we also know there is a tons of little techniques that can be used, but techniques, just the tools, Think pair share that I mentioned before is one of those. Another technique, simulations, game-based learning, uh, formal debates, four corners. If I divide you up and I give you a prompt and I ask you that you choose your space basis on what you think. That's another very common and very activity where you get the students, get to out of their, uh, their spaces and find their, their particular room. All of those are known, but they are just the tools. They are just the tools and may mean nothing if we haven't linked them specifically to the uh, learning outcomes. So, so what I'm trying to drive home is that the real work will have to happen within the study programs. And the real work has to happen within the department responsible for the study program overlooking and reviewing the entire progression of the student within that study program and checking for the student-centered elements within, within that study program. If I can be a little bit radical, I mean, I am advocating that syllabi for all of the courses within the study program are public. Um, and I'm even advocating that within the departments, we should be able to share our all teaching material so that it's clear that, that we know within the department when the student will get fundamental exposure, introductory courses. How does introductory courses are taught? Is the introductory course a 45 minute or God forbid, an hour long lecture without no and just questions at the end of the day or are introductory courses taught within this kind of a mini interventions, a problem set followed by the lecture, a problem set followed by the lecture, or a blended learning where the students have been listening to the pre-recorded lectures and then solving problems in the classroom, either alone or peer -to -peer, with a peer-to-peer. -peer. All of those are, are shown to be efficient techniques of actually helping students to, to activate their, their learning. Uh, and then down the line, when it comes, in which courses students can do some research. And it's not going to be every course in the study program that they will be doing all of that, that they will be doing field trips and that they will be doing research and things like that. It is just a question when, in which course, and in the complementarity you know, in the, of the, their uh, study program, will they be able to do all of that. I also wanted to say that um, there's another, oh, so, one is this essential link to the knowledge and the main work happening within the study program. But I also want to speak about some of the misconceptions that student-centered learning is not about adapting curriculum to the desires of students when these are at odds with the learning needs. It is not about pleasing the consumer and satisfying them, obviously. That the, that the academic integrity and the expertise still lies within the teacher, that the teacher is the one that will decide on the content, the activities, the assessment, that the teacher is the one who will be building the relationship and speaking to students and activating students' feedback uh, and engaging them in various activities. That it's student-centered learning is not about lowering of academic standards. And the student's learning is not about removing the teacher from the classroom, or considering the teachers to be superfluous, or to be an obstacle of natural progress of student learning. Because if we go into the, that kind of a line of argumentation, that would mean that you know, we no longer need higher education institutions, and we can get uh, knowledge from everywhere. It's not about that. It's actually much harder work for the teachers in order to do this kind of a plan. Every single class so that it will have some student-centered learning uh, elements. In my courses, I have 14 weeks. I teach higher education courses, sociology of higher education, uh, uh, higher education politics, uh, general education course on higher education. In this 14 weeks, every single class that I have has to have a plan. It's almost like a choreographic 
choreography of every single class. So that we know in every single, you know, within the first five minutes, the prompt, what's going to be the prompt? What is the learning expectation, learning outcome of that particular activity? What is the part of the lecture? What kind of assignment or mini assignment was, was linked with it prior to the lecture? Did I need to assess prior learning of the student before we have even started that activity? All of that for each of them. That should be something that, you know, they should be available. Uh, and if I was the chair of my department, I would have asked student, uh, my colleagues at the time of promotion, hiring, um, or even just as part of our departmental curricular conversations to share this kind of a plans for each particular classroom, because then we know what is actually happening. We know that in the Bologna process, we have done hard work with the ECTS and qualifications frameworks and translating our courses to comply and fit to those particular schools. But we have not done yet. We have not added the discussion about how we are reaching those learning outcomes. And that's really what I am asking. This, that's really what quality teaching means, that each individual teacher in the classroom has had this kind of preparation and has been thinking about how. Uh, how and what kind of activities, what kind of problems, and with what learning outcomes in mind w will, will have happened. So this is some of the, some of the this kind of uh, things that I wanted to talk about when we talk about curi uh, curriculum design. But also, uh, one thing that has come from the literature as a high impact practice is that one important thing is that we have to learn how to acknowledge prior knowledge and that is something that for each course, it has to happen really at the entry level already into the institutions, either with uh, where I have come from. In my classes, we, were, we started 600 and there was expectation that there would be two kind of introductory courses where half, maybe 60% of students will fail and will not proceed into the next year. Uh, will have to either repeat the class or will drop out completely. This really doesn't make sense to me, really doesn't make sense, this kind of approach. Either you weed them out at the entry point and you do not lure them into your classrooms uh, because they are not prepared, or if you want to have an open access for all, then you have to create support system for the students. You have to create either peer tutoring or you have to create some kind of individualized student support, you do either pre-test where students realize they have a gaps and you offer them support, either through computerized, that they, if they don't have enough statistics or mathematics or language needed in order to succeed in your program, you have to help them at the beginning or you don't take them in. So they were, this kind of a, okay, half of them will go in any case and the rest will, this, this really, it's, it's something and I hope you know, things are changing uh, uh, down the line. What we also know from the scholarship as a high impact factor is that we have to help students to connect what they are learning in the classroom to their lived experiences. It's not going to be perfectly and naturally possible for every single course in Tromats, but it should be possible in some way because that connection sparks their curiosity, shows them, gives them motivation, uh, kind of activates their wish to learn more. So, so connection to the lived experiences. And we have to, have to give them foundational knowledge. And this is, you know, something, there has to be some guided teaching. Student-centered learning, advo advocacy of student-centered learning does not mean we shouldn't impair foundational knowledge because without foundational knowledge, how they can possibly learn? But it's a question, how do you do that? Do you just do that with a lecture? Or do you do that with the problem sets, showing them what it is that they don't know and then feeding in the knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. So they, they are student-centered ways of impairing foundational knowledge and and they have been in the handbook we are doing there's an excellent case of physics professors who who used to go from lecture and solving problem sets on the board into an activity based uh, where they have them solve the lectures and then help them figure out what they have not known before etc cetera, etc cetera. another high impact factors offer feedback the, if it's the, the more timely the better the sooner the better and also engage students in a self-evaluation, kind of activate their uh, metacognition about their own learning and their own uh, ability. And uh, 
one more thing that I wanted to, to highlight is this kind of enhanced student-teacher interactions. And I know that gets very difficult when we have a lot of students. And if, you ha if I have 100, I have difficulties requiring that each meets me for the office hours at least once. I usually, I usually do that, but now I have to spread my office hours with my TF so that they meet me or my teaching assistants. So, but what we know is that students actually value if there is a teacher that knows them personally, somebody that cares about their learning. And we also need to demystify the, their idea that coming to office hours is something that you have to have a Nobel Prize winning questions, otherwise you, know, you should not be showing up for the office hours. It's also from the teacher to invite students to come in order to have this kind of a personal interaction. The way to solve this mass body problem um, is, a, is a real challenge. Um, and uh, my only suggestion here would be is to engage graduate students and undergraduate students as teaching assistants and teaching fellows. Um, it will be difficult you know, to suggest to the rectors across university that, that there should be no classes larger than 100 people or 200 people, um, it's a difficult proposition to make, especially in the, when we are trying to enlarge access and uh, for all. And the only way that you can actually go about it is to have support from the graduate students in order to at least make smaller sections or smaller seminars where this kind of one-on-one -on -one, one interactions become possible. And the final one here about this kind of high impact practices, of course, is assessment. And we speak a lot about uh, assessment. The capstone project, and the capstone project can have very different uh, formats. Is it just the end, high stake, final exam, uh, multiple questions, or, or an essay? Or it's a series of a smaller assessments uh, at different stages, or is it a research-based paper? In my courses, because I do a kind of research-oriented type of teaching, it's always a large research paper, but, it's, but this paper is cut into the five smaller assignments prior to the papers. They first have to do one essay, which will identify a research question. The next one will be identification of research methods and review of the literature. Then they have to give me the outline of their findings. And then comes the presentation. And then comes the final paper. And each of those is graded, which means that at the end, students just kind of put together. It's not that they have to start from the, from the scratch, writing the paper when the paper is due. They actually just compile the previous assignments and and at the very final, fi final basis. So, so, I, so this is, th 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 I have junked a lot into the, this area of study program and course design because it's such a, it's a key, it's the heart of the student-centered learning approach. But let me just speak in a few more minutes about learner support and teacher support. Learner support or student support, it's usually what we speak about uh, study guidance, study skills, uh, peer tutoring, uh, counseling, also men mental counseling. Um, and we, because of the premises of the student learning, which empowers the student to be more, to be more responsible for one on, uh, one's own learning, we have to have mechanisms in place that will help students who are not prepared to take to, to enact this agency. Not everybody comes from families who have been through the higher education before. There is lots of students are first generation students who have absolutely no fam familiarity with the context of higher education, uh, for higher education and how to navigate it. Many students lack basic study skills because this is not something that they have been taught in the high schools. This is where it comes, uh, becomes important responsibility of the higher education institutions on the institutional level to have systems in place to either run the workshops or have computer based programs on study skills um, or organize the kind of orientation workshops of them. 
And I am very much in support of peer tutoring, student peer tutoring. Students who have been through courses or are part of the study program and are in advanced grades that can actually uh, work as tutors to the younger students. And these people should be paid at least something symbolically or otherwise recognized, either through credits uh, or in a different way. This is, it shouldn't be a just charitable work because we want to give it a symbolic value, uh, and if possible also monetary value for, for their work. And tutoring, at least from experience that I have, is hugely rewarding for the students who are tutors. It also inactivates their own metacognition. It's also a learning activity for the tutors themselves equally as for, th for those that are their, their tutees. So this is one aspect that I would uh, like to highlight. So peer tutoring, apart from teaching student, students being self-regulated, metacognition, reflection on our, their own learning paths, uh, and things, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And again, I want to make a link back to the study programs. It shouldn't be just the office somewhere uh, that you know, exists and there is in information material. The best way is to actually get people responsible for tutoring into the departments, into the, into the, into the classroom to introduce what they do, to make the connection, to have students see the face of the people that they can go to if they need some help, uh, so that otherwise it's not going to be really utilized. Teaching and teacher support. Again, teaching becomes more difficult with student-centered learning, more difficult. There's more work of thinking of every single activity. Getting a lecture done, it's easy by comparison rather than thinking of what kind of activities will be purposeful for what learning outcome and what kind of a support will be needed. So professional development of the teachers, of course, is important. But again, given that we have a mass higher education system, given that we have a mass classrooms, individual instructor cannot do everything alone. Academic staff is not sufficient. I'm strongly urging for considering ways of engaging graduate students and undergraduate students as teaching assistants. In my classes, I have my graduate student who is a teaching assistant who can run the section or seminar and discuss the readings and work with the projects. And I have undergraduates who's, who help students with specific research design projects. Um, um, even back in my days, uh, in, in, in Slovenia, uh, in the accountancy program, there was a professor who would regularly hire undergraduate students to, as a, we call them demonstratory, demonstrators, who would be uh, showing students how to do the accountant, accountancy. And, and that's, that's really helpful way of kind of a more individualized uh, uh, support as well. Final one that I wanted to highlight is the community learning connections. And what I mean by this is, um, I want to highlight the importance of inquiry-based learning or research-based learning. I said before that within each study program, at some stage, there should be an element where students were given an opportunity to engage either in basic research, applied research, work with the researchers, uh, do the workplace type of activity, which also has a research d d dimension. So there should be a research component in the, as part of the study programs. And there was, in the handbook, we have a nice case, uh, case presented where within the particular study program, the incoming students are put into the groups and are asked to interview one researcher, one academic staff researcher at the university in order to get familiar with the research, uh, with the research of that particular person. And they interview the person and then they have this kind of a regular meeting so that they understand what it is that that researcher does and, and get kind of an insight into the research world of, of the discipline and, and make a connection to the discipline. So this is a way of uh, uh, engaging them. In my own uh, courses, um, they're all about higher education and students love to do research into higher education, into their own student experience. So I either ask them to come with a research question uh, direct to the class that they would like to do as a research or I connect them to various offices within our university with the Office of Student Life um, and the Office of Student Life suggests we don't know enough what's happening within the dormitories or how to organize better the dormitories. Or we don't, one, one student uh, had the idea of investigating how the 
restaurants or, you know, menzas, uh, uh, student-run restaurants, serve, what kind of functions serve and how much of a social life and what kind of a socializing happens in those restaurants. And that was his research uh, project. Um, or I connect them with uh, our dean for undergraduate education and the dean of undergraduate education wanted to change the course evaluations and my students said, why don't we test the students' approaches to course evaluations, and then we can feed in this information into the uh, institutional discussion on how the new course evaluation instruments should look like. So it's, it's a way of, you know, those are my communities. People in different fields have other communities. They have industry that they can connect students. It takes me a lot of work to make these connections. It takes a lot of work to find, you know, people, administrators who are willing to work with my students, meet them at least one, offer the questions, um, giving, give them some information, but that makes their, their research meaningful and at the end we showcase everything there is a publication there is an online website where all of student research is actually showcased so it's something it's not something that i just read great put into my drawer they have as part of their portfolio but it actually has potential for real potential for impact or at least to inform and inspire uh, practice and other student researchers so i'll end up with, I have talked now, this, these are the practices. And again, the techniques are easy, think per share, and don't waste time of you know, doing, spending much time on this because you go to any website of any kind of a teaching and learning lab and you will find them. You go to Able Connect at Harvard and you will find at least six, seven, eight of those practices nicely dis dis uh, explained and you can easily translate them for your own people. It's, it's an easy thing, it's just the tools. The work has to happen within the departments and the connection with the le learning outcome. So just, you know, just few things about design and evaluation. And then I'll, uh, how many do I have? Two minutes, three minutes? Let's see, I'll be very quick. Let's go first to the departmental le level. I'm part of the evaluation committee coming to your departments to evaluate the, uh, the student-centeredness of your study program, of a study program. What it is that I'm going to look for? I'm going to first look about, my main function will be, I will want to see the syllabi or collection of syllabi of the study program. First, you know, which course is the syllabi. And I would really like to see as well uh, teaching materials that are used in a kind of a selected, randomly selected four courses or five courses, just to, to see what kind of a techniques and what kind of activities and what kind of assessment and what kind of a learning and how these are linked to the learning outcomes. This is how we can know. We cannot know just for syllabi because this is the readings and intents. We have to see the teaching notes. And as a dean, you know, or a chair of your department, you should be able to ask that from your faculty. I'm willing to give you, as an instructor, I'm, going, I'm willing to give you my, my entire design, course design so that you can determine how student-centered my teaching actually is. And that should be possible and reasonable to ask. And I, as an evaluator, would like to see some of those just to see how it exists. I would also like to see how many of the student-centered elements are in the entire course Remember how we discussed at the beginning? Is there opportunity for research? How much connection to the com communities outside the university? Workplace type of collaborative learning, peer-to-peer -peer learning, when it happens and within which courses? Again, knowing that not each course will have all of those elements. I would like to see the professional development for the teachers and, well, first, how you as a community of within your department develop your curriculum and also what kind of professional development opportunities they are for the teachers in your own department. How do you develop your teaching material? Where do you draw from? Um, and then I would also like to see if you have a pool of graduate students and undergraduate students that you can pull into the teaching based on the sizes of the classrooms and, and, and the number of students that you have to cater for. If there is mentorship for the younger instructors from the older process, uh, instructors, in which way your department is supported by those institutional level of uh, support systems, the, uh, the libraries, the information technology, uh, the teaching support. Those would be some of the major kind of issues. If I move quickly to the institutional level, in the institutional level, I would want to know as an institution, as a university, or as a faculty, or a school, how have you arranged for the 
learning spaces. How many of your classrooms actually have movable chairs and movable tables? And how many of your classrooms have you know, multiple monitors for multiple presentations? Uh, of the old classrooms that are available to you? And uh, what kind of a technology enhanced learning support are you offered? What, are, what is your course software? And what else is there? Uh, do you utilize you know, blended learning, whether you have possibilities for individually paced type of learning activities, especially to, in the foundational courses? Um, I would also like to know what are the rules and regulations uh, for hiring, promotion, workload, and professional development of teachers when it comes to the teaching specifically. So, you know, is teaching, in which way teaching is really acknowledged as part of hiring, promotion, the workload? Um, are there any incentive, financial or symbolic, for excellence in teaching and especially uh, application and development of the student centered approaches? And are there incentives for course development that will be adopting student centered elements? Uh, and what kind of analytics within the departments you collect on the you know, learner analytics, on the uh, student profiles and activities and uh, progression courses, et cetera, et cetera. So th those would be some kind of a, and then if I move into the, if I am doing your future proofing of the, your national higher education system, which I often do, in fact, um, of course, I would look into the policy that you have for the teaching and excellence and whether there is intention of adopting student-centered learning approaches. But I would also be uh, looking to what extent those policies are actually asking of the institutions uh, and the departments to move from the definition of qualification frameworks and the learning outcomes into the defining the methods of teaching and how those will be achieved. And what kind of a capacity building uh, um, support is there from the national level? Are there financial incentives? Is there pooling, you know, pooling of the EU money that is, can be attributed for advancement of teaching and learning? And what it is that you ask of higher education institutions in terms of their performance in your annual reporting? And finally, do your qualification frameworks, quality assurance frameworks on the national level have very well defined indicators that kind of uh, reflect some of those elements of uh, higher education, uh, student-centered higher education systems. So that would be on the national level. I'm ending by one perhaps slightly controversial note, and that is that teacher-centered versus student-centered, progressive, versus traditional, in my view, are perhaps overly simplistic, um, binary kind of designation um, that might not be even particularly helpful in, in our discussions, because teachers might feel threatened that now the, all the attention in the students, um, and at the end of the day, there is a spectrum of the activities from more guided teaching into more active learning. I would much more advise to talk about, think about teaching and learning as rela essentially relational activity, essentially as a partnership, a, a collaboration, a co-constructive knowledge where each of the stakeholders, both the students and the teachers, and all of the auxiliary the teaching staff, the graduate students, the, the undergraduate teaching assistants, the librarians, the information technology, the teaching support pe people, all have a particular role to play. So it's a collaborative, almost like a community of practice of teaching rather than just thinking, is it what we have, teacher-oriented or, or student-centered learning? Thank you.